Hi everyone, thank you for joining today. We are sharing our slides now. Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Jamie, your vice president. Thank you. So thank you for joining today. We're really excited to have you and just talked about this program. Um, the goal for this year, for the New York City chapter is interprofessional collaboration with speakers from allied health care professionals to support collaboration and interdisciplinary education. So because pharmacists are in different settings and they might be asked different questions about nutrition and dietary supplements, this program will help us provide a background about nutrition and dietary supplements. So tonight I'd like to introduce my speaker, Hilary Sachs, a registered dietitian. She's also board certified in oncology nutrition. She's a nutrition program supervisor at Northwell Health Monster Cancer Center and has been faculty at Hofstra University's nutrition program. Hillary is the owner of her consulting practice, Hillary Sachs Nutrition, LLC. She also belongs to several professional associations such as Academy of Nutri Nutrition and Dietetics, Oncology Nutrition and Dietetics Practice, Dietitians in an Integrative and Functional Medicine Practice, Sports, Cardiovascular, and Wellness Nutrition and Dietetics Practice. And she's also a really close friend of mine, so we're really excited to have her here tonight. And without further ado, I'll turn the screen over to Tilly. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you everybody for joining. It's a little different to be virtual this year. It's always nice to see people in person and really get that dynamic. So um, we'll definitely try to answer as many questions as we can at the end and feel free to use the chat box, which Jamie will help moderate at the end. Um, so as Jamie mentioned, I'm a dietitian and I love collaborating, especially with pharmacists. Um, there are so many patient questions that come up about um, food drug interactions, especially having to do with dietary supplements. So Jamie felt that this topic would be really relevant. Um, and as um, Jamie and I were developing the content, there were so many different topics that she jumped in and said, oh, this would be great background. And um, you know, this would be so interesting. So we have a little bit of everything in this presentation. That's why it's called Dietary Supplements and Nutrition. So we'll start out with a little bit more of the nutrition and some of the background about that. And then we'll delve into the dietary supplement piece. Um, so our learning objectives for tonight are to learn about dietary, the dietary guidelines and also how cooking methods could affect the different nutrient contents within foods, to learn about macro versus micronutrients, to learn about the dietary reference intake levels, to learn about phytochemicals and antioxidants, understand the difference between nutrients from food versus supplements, um, naming food drug interactions, and becoming familiar with certain resources to evaluate supplement safety. Um, so by way of background, um, figuring out what we eat um, is um, supposed to be intuitive and natural to our bodies, um, but with so many different um, brands and processed foods and um, so many different products in the supermarket, it's really important to sometimes take a step back to make sure that we're meeting all of our nutrient needs. And the Dietary Guidelines for Americans really puts out um, how much of certain food groups we need to be eating in order to ensure that we are meeting our nutrient needs. So way back when, you may be familiar with the food pyramid, um, that was a model to show how much of each food group we should be eating to ensure that we're eating enough of each nutrient. But people, um, the feedback was that it was a little bit confusing. So. Now they have something called my plate, which you see a picture of at the bottom, which shows you the ratios of how your plate should be fit, uh, split up um, in order to ensure that you're getting all your food groups and thus all of your nutrients. So half your plate fruits or vegetables, half your uh, a quarter of your plate grains, a quarter of your plate protein, that could be animal protein or plant protein and dairy or non-dairy options. So, um, does nutrient, does cooking food affect nutritional content? Um, I would take a show of hands to see if you think it does or doesn't, but since we can't do that, I'll just give you one second to think about that. Um, most people, when I ask this question in person, automatically say, yes, it 
does affect nutritional content. And that's absolutely right. But when I ask people how you think it affects nutritional content, many people think that it actually decreases the amount of uh, nutrients in a food. Um, and that may be correct, but is not always correct. So for our water soluble vitamins like vitamin C and the B vitamins, um, niacin, riboflavin, panthenoic acid, choline, um, B12, B6, those are just some of our B vitamins. Um, those mostly are reduced when cooking. They're more unstable. So whether they're being heated or exposed to light, they do tend to degrade. So depending on your cooking method, they degrade more or less. Um, by contrast, a lot of the fat soluble vitamins actually increase in bioavailability when you cook them. So all of the vitamin A derivatives like beta carotene found in carrots or lycopene found in tomatoes, um, lutein or zeaxanthin found in um, summer squash or spinach tend to increase when you cook them. Um, um, also quite interestingly, um, especially for people who are iron deficient and looking to avoid um, iron supplements, there's so many iron rich foods that are out there, but also if you cook in a cast iron pan, some of the iron from the pan actually leaches into the food, thus increasing your iron intake. Boiling actually reduces nutrient content um, the most as compared with other cooking methods, particularly if you're draining the water. But if you are drinking the water, either using the water for part of your recipe or making a soup, the nutrients, particularly the um, water soluble nutrients will decrease because they degrade, but you will still get some of them. Um, sauteing and stir frying is a great thing to do because it's only exposing the foods to heat for a very short time. So it, it, there still may be some loss of water soluble vitamins, but minimal loss. Um, so that's interesting. There was also a study that came out that showed that blood lycopene levels, lycopene is the phytonutrient found in a lot of red fruits and vegetables like tomatoes, watermelon, that sort of thing, increased when um, they consumed cooked tomatoes actually sauteed in olive oil. And that sort of makes sense to me when I take a step back because vitamin A is one of our fat soluble vitamins. So any fat soluble vitamin like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, really needs uh, to be consumed with fat in order for absorption. And that could also um, be an important point for patients or people who have any sort of fat malabsorption. They really need to be careful and make sure that they get enough of those fat soluble vitamins. Um, this is just another screenshot from another study. It's just showing that bioavailability of that lycopene increased in tomatoes when cooked. So um, tomato paste actually had more lycopene as compared with fresh tomatoes which some people may find surprising. Okay, so just to get back to our agenda now that we talked about um, how certain macro and micronutrients can decrease when or increase when you cook them, we'll take a step back and just um, describe what exactly macro and micronutrients are. So macronutrients are mostly the things that actually provide energy in the form of calories to our body. And micronutrients are mostly things that provide substances needed for growth and health in the body. So the main category of macronutrients are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Those are all the things that provide energy to our bodies. By contrast, um, micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. Um, essential nutrients, which I'll mention a little bit throughout the presentation, so I just wanted to define, are things um, that our bodies cannot actually synthesize enough of for daily function. So they're required in our diets. So carbohydrates are actually an essential nutrient, which many people don't realize. Um, our bodies can create carbohydrates from other macronutrients, but not very efficiently. Um, and all the cells in our body use carbohydrates for fuel, with the exception of our brains, which can use some ketone bodies as well. Um, certain kinds of amino acids are considered essential. Um, there are essential fatty acids like EPA, DHA, ALA, which we'll get into, um, and certain vitamins and minerals. And of course, water is considered essential. So for our macronutrients, something that some people find surprising as well is that carbohydrates and proteins actually provide the same amount of calories per gram, um, four calories per gram to be exact. 
Um, some people think that carbohydrates provide more calories as compared with protein, and that's not actually the case. Fats provide about a little more than double calories per gram at nine calories per gram. Um, and alcohol, which some people do consider to be a fourth macronutrient, provides about seven calories per gram. Um, and of course, the amount of nutrients a person depends on so many different factors. It's not that standard 2000 calories fits all. Even for a standard person, um, your calorie and nutrient needs can vary from day to day just based on bodily processes that you have no control of over that are happening on a daily basis. But besides that, we know that the amount of nutrients a person needs is dependent on age, body size, genetics, um, certain illnesses going on, of course, certain medications people are taking, um, anabolic needs like pregnancy and lactation, growth. Um, so lots of th different things we factor into figuring out how much nutrients a person needs. Um, and now I'm going to go through um, each main category of macronutrients, the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and then we'll get into our micronutrients briefly. So carbohydrates, um, as I mentioned, are an essential nutrient. So we can't synthesize enough that we need on a daily basis. We need to consume a certain amount um, per day. Um, we need about 50% of our calories per day, according to the dietary guidelines, to function at our optimum. Um, if you ever cut out carbohydrates for a long period of time and you try to do um, intense short-term exercise like sprint, you may find you get tired more easily. Um, that's because your muscles may not have as much glycogen stores in them. And out of those carbohydrates, as much as possible, we want to choose um, fiber-rich carbohydrates. So fiber-rich carbohydrates are things like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, um, Females need about 21 to 25 grams of fiber per day, whereas males need about 30 to 38 grams of fiber in a day. And just as a reference, an apple provides about four grams of fiber per day, whereas a cup of beans provides about 14 grams of fiber per day. Um, so depending on the food, um, you can mix and match to get up to that, that goal level. Um, and carbohydrates are, and fiber-rich carbohydrates in particular, are mostly found in plant sources. Um, milk is actually one of the only animals, uh, animal sources of carbohydrates. Its carbohydrate is lactose. Um, and just wanted to provide this slide also as a reference for you guys. Um, sugars, um, honeys, all these sorts of things are do fall under the category of carbohydrates. Um, interestingly enough, um, each has pros and cons. There's no perfect answer, unfortunately, but um, uh, sucrose, which is white sugar, brown sugar, which is mostly white sugar, just with molasses in it, by the way. Um, fructose, uh, sorry, sucrose, brown sugar, honey, and high fructose corn syrup. So this one, this one, this one, and this one actually all contain about the same ratio of glucose to fructose as each other, which is quite interestingly enough. Um, some of them get a worse wrap off than others. Uh, for example, high fructose corn syrup usually gets um, a worse wrap as compared with honey. But a lot of that I think is just the fact that Corn syrup is typically found in foods that have little nutritional value as compared with maybe products that honey has, but pretty much has the same ratio of glucose to fructose. So that's interesting. Um, stevia is one that's hot on the market. It actually comes from an herb like basil or oregano. It just is an herb called stevia. And sometimes people granulate it um, and use it as a sweetener because it's naturally sweet. Even if you took the leaves off, it would taste sweet. Um, so it doesn't raise the blood sugar much. The challenge with it is to minimize its aftertaste. It does have a little bit of a licorice aftertaste. And when they process it to kind of turn it into a sugar looking packet, there may be some chemicals that form like glycosides. We're not quite sure. There really isn't enough studies out about it. Um, so the best form of it is its natural leaf form or the liquid extract form is more natural than the packet form. Um, and interestingly enough, especially for you guys, it's important to note that it could interact with certain drugs like hypertension drugs, hyperglycemia drugs. Um, Steva could actually further lower people's blood pressure or further lower people's blood sugar, which may or may not be a good thing depending on what their dose of medication is. So something just to look out for. 
Okay, our next category of macronutrient is protein and amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Um, so like I mentioned before, there are certain amino acids that are considered essential, meaning that our bodies cannot make enough of them. So they really must be provided by the diet. There are other proteins that are considered non-essential, meaning our bodies can make enough of them. There is also something called protein quality. Um, when describing protein quality, we're talking about foods that contain all of the essential amino acid in that single food. Um, and that mostly is animal proteins like milk, cheese, meat, and eggs. There are some plant fruit foods that contain all the essential amino acids like quinoa, um, like um, soy and tofu and some of the other ancient grains. But for the most part, a lot of other plant proteins such as beans, nuts, seeds only contain some of the am essential amino acids. So that's why it's really important if you're working with someone who is a vegan to make sure that they're eating a lot of different kinds of plant sources and pairing them together correctly so that they ensure they're getting all the essential amino acids their body needs. So for example, like rice and beans is a great combination because the rice, the grain contains one half of the essential amino acids and the legume or the beans contains the other half of the essential amino acid. So when we pair them together, they kind of complement each other and give you the full spectrum of essential amino acids. And that's true of even something like peanut butter on bread. So you got your grain and your legume. So you get all of your essential amino acids. And for protein, it's usually recommended that we provide um, about 10 to 35% of our total energy intake from protein. A lot of Americans are consuming much more than this. And this could be problematic, putting people at risk for osteoporosis. So our body uses calcium to buffer the amino acid, the acidic load, if we're over consuming protein over time. Um, and then of course, um, it could put our body at risk of like kidney issues down the line. And that's really for people who are way over consuming protein chronically. So our next category of macronutrients is our fats, or our lip lipids. And um, certain kinds of fats are solid at room temperature. Um, most solid fats are considered saturated fats, which are more atherogenic as compared with liquid fats, like oils, um, which tend to be less atherogenic. That rule does not hold true for all uh, solid fats and liquid fats, but it's a good rule of thumb just as a quick um, a quick method to go through. So um, as I mentioned, they're saturated and unsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats are usually touted as more heart healthy as compared with saturated fats. And then we have mono unsaturated fats, meaning there's only one double bond and poly unsaturated fats, meaning there are two or more double bonds in the fat. We also have trans fats, which um, are a big thing. Trans fats um, mean, are, mean that they take a liquid fat and they actually force in an extra hydrogen atom so that it becomes a solid fat, um, but there's still that double bond in existence. And trans fats are really um, much more atherogenic or not heart healthy as co even compared with saturated fats. So when you're looking at a nutrition label, you could even read the ingredient list if you see something that says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, that means it is a trans fat and you as much as possible want to minimize your consumption of that. Our essential fatty acids are our omega-6s and omega-3s. Most people have heard of omega-3s. Um, omega-3 simply means that um, the first double bond occurs on the third carbon from the end. Um, our omega-3s are everything from alpha-linolenic acid or ALA to EPA and DHA. And I'll get into what the differences are between those in just a second. And then our other essential fat is our omega-6s or linolenic, linoleic acid. Um, that's one of the main ones. Um, and we still need omega-6s in our diet but too much omega-6s are also not great for our hearts. So we'll get into that briefly as well. So are all omega-3s created equal? Is the omega-3 that's found in the Smart Balance the same thing as eating fish? Um, well, 
Unfortunately, no. Um, the omega-3 that's found in usually fortified products, but also just plant foods like flaxseed, chia seeds, walnuts, is this ALA. And this is really our main essential omega-3 because we could make EPA and DHA from that. However, our bodies are very inefficient at doing so. So we lose like for like mostly everything. I think um, EPA and DHA are over 14 times more effective than ALA. So we still, we this is still really important, but we um, are not very good at converting it to EPA and DHA. Um, and as you can see on this slide, which we'll get into a little bit more later about anti-inflammatory foods, EPA and DHA really work to stop arachidonic acid production, which directly is a producer of prostaglandins. And we know that prostaglandins are related to inflammation. In a lot of westernized countries, um, we do find that um, we're consuming much more omega-6s as compared with omega-3s. Um, and again, omega-6s are a little more inflammatory, whereas omega-3s are more anti-inflammatory. So again, these are omega-6s, eventually could lead to prostaglandin synthesis, whereas omega-3s um, block prostaglandin synthesis. So the United States, urban India, consumes much more omega-6s as compared with omega-3s. By contrast, Paleolithic times, rural places in India, Japan, consume much more omega-3s as compared with omega-6. Um, I also want to throw in dietary cholesterol since, since this does fall under lipids or fat. Um, cholesterol is very interesting. Um, most people, as we consume more dietary cholesterol in and of itself, we actually, our bodies produce less cholesterol. So a lot of people then after hearing that will ask, well, why do people have elevated cholesterol then if our bodies are downregulating the amount we produce if we eat more? Um, and the reason is, is that dietary cholesterol doesn't usually get overproduced from this method from dietary cholesterol consumption, it usually gets produced more from saturated fat and trans fat consumption. So that's really where we look in people's diets if somebody has high cholesterol. If somebody is high triglycerides, that's typically more um, refined carbohydrate consumption, overconsumption. But cholesterol is quite important to our bodies, which a lot of people forget about. Um, estrogen, testosterone, and even vitamin D all have a cholesterol backbone. So we really do need to have enough, um, but our bodies do produce it. We need about 20 to 35% of our total calories coming from fat in order to absorb all our fat soluble vitamins, get all our nutrients according to the dietary guidelines. Um, and our emphasis as much as possible should be on those polyunsaturated fats, which are more heart healthy. Again, I wanted to throw this slide in as a reference for you guys. It goes through some of the more common um, cooking oils and their pros and cons. Uh, for example, olive oil is an extremely heart healthy um, oil. However, especially the extra virgin olive oil has a very low smoke point, meaning that it oxidizes when it heats up. So therefore, it wouldn't be a great choice for cooking, but would be a wonderful choice for salads, dressings, or pouring on after something's cooked. Um, I think, um, and this, this is just a personal opinion when weighing all the pros and cons, right now it seems like avocado oil um, is probably the best cooking oil in the sense that it has a very high smoke point, meaning it doesn't burn so easily and is an unsaturated fat and doesn't have a super strong flavor. The downside to that one is the cost. It tends to be um, a little more pricey as compared with something like canola oil. So again, I mentioned this before, but our, um, now we're gonna get into our micronutrients. So we have our fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K. And we have our water soluble vitamins, which are B vitamins mostly, and vitamin C. Vitamins are just one part of our micronutrients. And for to, in order to determine our micronutrient needs for both our vitamins and minerals, um, the Institute of Medicine has put out different recommendations and different levels for what would meet the needs of the population and what would cause toxicity in the population. 
So these are our minerals as well. Um, so the recommendations that they put out, and I like to highlight this here, only apply to healthy people. So there may be certain categories of people where these nutrient recommendations don't hold true, um, like people who are ill um, and may need more of certain nutrients for healing. Like let's, um, let's say somebody just had surgery, they may actually need more zinc and vitamin C after surgery than what's recommended in order to heal. Um, so I'm going to show you this slide, but more visually on this next slide, the Institute of Medicine puts out these um, recommendations. Um, they put out this thing called the EAR or estimated average requirement. And this is the nutrient amount that's supposed to meet the needs about half of the population. And many times they also put out an RDA or a recommended daily allowance. And this is supposed to meet the needs of 98% of the population. So why do they have different um, types of recommendations. Um, they also have adequate intake and tolerable upper limits. Well, the reason why they have um, different um, markers for recommendations is based on the amount and the strength of the research. Um, if there is not a lot of research on a particular nutrient, quite typically, there's only an adequate intake level as put out by um, the Institute of Medicine. For example, choline is a B vitamin, um, but it's recently um, been researched, um, especially during pregnancy to promote um, health and brain development in the fetus. Um, but there is only an adequate intake level now. There is no EAR, estimated average requirement, and there is no RDA. Tolerable upper, upper limit is a really important marker um, many times clients come to me with multiple bottles of supplements. And when I take a close look at the label, I find that they're taking the same nutrient in multiple bottles. And looking at this upper limit line is a great marker to make sure they're not reaching toxicity, especially because supplements aren't the only source of nutrients for people. Quite typically, they're also eating food. So we have to factor that in as well. Phytochemicals and antioxidants also fall under the category of micronutrients. And as a dietitian, in order to get enough phytochemicals and antioxidants, typically recommend that people eat the rainbow because the deep colors in foods um, are a reflection on how much phytochemicals and antioxidants are in that food. Um, we know that phytochemicals are chemicals in plants that actually have a health benefit. And there are studies that show that phytochemicals promote healthy cell signaling, uh, decrease inflammation, help metabolize carcinogens, promote apoptosis in cells that aren't behaving correctly, and help regulate healthy gene expression. When it comes to antioxidants, there are, is something called the ORAC model for determining how much antioxidants are in a particular food. Um, scientists are still trying to figure out what this means and if this is really a determinant of health, but they did find that wild blueberries seem to have one of the highest antioxidant um, ORAC scores as compared to even fresh blueberries. Um, and then there are certain antioxidants that we actually can produce um, internally. Um, ubiquinol, which is another word for CoQ10, something important for muscle and heart health, we actually produce internally. Um, if somebody is on something um, like a statin drug, they may not be um, producing enough. They may be going through it more in their bodies. So they may need to supplement more of that. Um, there are other antioxidants that are exogenous, meaning we don't produce and we have to consume externally, like vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, selenium, and certain carotenoids. Flavonoids are also a micronutrient, um, and flavonoids also have health benefit. So the flavonoid found in apples is quercetin, and that is supposed to help with food allergies. The flavonoid in green tea, for example, is called EGCG, and that's supposed to promote healthy detoxification. So after looking at all these um, flavonoids and antioxidants and um, vitamins and minerals, for some people, it could be overwhelming. So why not just take a supplement for all these and forget about eating these foods? 
Well, there's quite a few reasons. Um, first of all, the cost. Um, you know, the uh, National Institute of Health said that people in America are paying about $12.8 billion a year just on supplements. So especially for people that may not have the extra money, um, it may not be possible. There's also some degree of risk because supplements are not regulated, which I'll briefly get into later in the presentation. In general, foods that are very high in micronutrients and phytochemicals and antioxidants, they also tend to be low in glycemic index and low in calories, just promoting a healthy body weight. Um, and we know that promoting a healthy body weight is important for preventing certain chronic diseases. In addition, the body handles food and supplements very differently, which I'll get into briefly as well. And isolated nutrients may actually upset and um, disrupt chemical reactions. So we'll get into that briefly in two. So first off, I wanted to highlight synergy. So this slide, you're not supposed to be able to read every little thing. So don't be upset if you are squinting at your screen. But this actually is a list of all of the micronutrients found in an apple. And as I mentioned before, um, something like quercetin is the flavonoid found in an apple. So somebody is simply taking quercetin to get all of the benefits out of apples instead of eating apples, they're missing out on all of these other nutrients. Synergy, the word synergy also applies to the fact that um, certain nutrients actually help each other to absorb. And a lot of times people, um, foods inherently in nature have multiple nutrients that help each other to absorb. Or culturally, we eat foods in tandem that help each other absorb. So for example, um, in beets, the beet and the beet green contains B6 and magnesium, which helps each other to absorb. Um, culturally, um, a lot of times um, when making things like curries, people use both turmeric and black pepper. And those two things actually help each other, curcumin, uh, help each other to absorb. The biopepperine in the pepper actually helps the curcumin in the turmeric to absorb into your body. We may or may not find all those things just in a single supplement. And as I mentioned before, and as you guys well know well enough, these reactions are not occurring in a Petri dish. Um, so when we add a lot of something to a chemical reaction, it really does affect the overall reactions and overall processes occurring in the body. And this slide is just showing um, a simple um, reaction, but using a lot of different micronutrients. So you see that both vitamin E, vitamin C, NADH, which is a form of niacin, um, as well as ubiquinone, CoQ10, polyunsaturated fatty acids, GSH or glutathione, which is um, a, a phytonutrient, all interplay with one another. So it's not just like if you're taking vitamin E, it's not gonna affect all of your other micronutrients. It certainly is. And these reactions occur as part of larger, even larger reactions. It's really important just to keep that in mind. Um, and then there are, I could have created probably 10 slides with even more nutrients of how supplements and foods are a little different. Um, one, one that I didn't occur that, that, that I didn't write on the slide that comes to mind is iron. You know, iron supplements for a lot of people could cause digestive distress. Whereas iron rich foods like beans may actually promote digestive regularity. Um, and when you pair an iron rich food with a food source of vitamin C, you actually absorb more of it. So there's lots of ways how foods um, actually can be different than supplements. And there are many cases as highlighted in the slide where supplements can actually cause toxicities. Whereas foods, the form found in food, our bodies actually regulate better and toxicity isn't really possible and isn't really seen. Um, over at the bottom, an example of this would be vitamin A. Um, we know that as prescription, Accutane is a form of vitamin A and this can actually cause teratogenic effects in pregnancy. It could cause depression, which you as pharmacists and doctors have to watch out for in people that are prescribed this medication. Um, whereas food forms of vitamin A um, typically don't cause this. 
That being said, a lot of plant forms of vitamin A are preformed vitamin A, like beta carotene and lycopene and zeaxanthin, and our body will only really convert what we need. The biggest um, side effect of overconsuming something like beta carotene from carrots would be like your skin getting an orange hue, but that's not necessarily going to cause any sort of detrimental side effect. There are also a number of studies that show that supplements may actually not always be beneficial. Sometimes they may be harmful. Sometimes they may show just no benefit at all. So for example, um, by the, in the SELECT trial, vitamin E and selenium supplements actually increased the risk of prostate cancer. In the Women's Health Study, vitamin E supplements did not prevent cancer. Um, by contrast, in the SELECT trial, they actually did find that vitamin E and selenium rich foods decrease the risk of cancer. Um, and we know that vitamin E, the form of vitamin E in nature is different than mostly the form of vitamin E found in supplements. In nature, it usually occurs as gamma tocopherol and in supplements usually occurs as alpha tocopherol. So that may or may not have a difference or impact. And there are so many herb drug interactions and this list is not comprehensive. Um, St. John's wort, which we do know is very effective against depression, actually interacts with many medications, almost every one. Um, even something like garlic can actually interfere with certain HIV medications and even chemotherapies. So we do have to be careful. And something also that's really important, especially for people with allergies, is label reading on supplements. So one thing I really wanted to highlight is the fact that supplements are not regulated the same way that foods are in this country. So the DSHEA or the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act um, made the fact that the FDA can only be on the supplement if they find proof after the fact that it's released that it's dangerous and that supplements are reviewed but not approved prior to marketing. So um, there's not strict regulation guidelines. So particularly for people who have allergies, I always encourage them to look for this USP seal. And USP stands for the United States Pharmacopeia. And it's a scientific nonprofit organization that basically will test supplements to make sure and verify that what's on the label is actually in the bottle. Um, supplements pay money to have this USP label stamped on their um, label, but it's a really good thing to look for. And we know, especially for people with food allergies, it could be pretty important depending on the severity of the allergy. Um, I also encourage people to check the other ingredients on the um, supplement label. A lot of times we'll see soybean oil, wheat or mal maltodextrin, milk or whey. So those are all common allergens we just wanna be careful with. Now, um, there are certain populations who really do need routine supplementation. Um, these are people like um, people who are pregnant or lactating are very at risk of nutrient deficiencies and it is recommended that they take um, multivitamins. Um, people aren't any sort of restricted diet, whether it's for an illness or otherwise, um, or perhaps bariatric surgery. Um, elderly, um, people with low economic, socioeconomic status who may not be really eating that my plate very regularly. Um, these groups really may require routine supplementation to determine and ensure nutritional adequacy. And we do know that there is evidence of benefit for certain supplements as well. Um, vitamin D definitely helps improve seasonal affective disorder. Um, there is some great new research on the fact that certain strains of probiotics can help prevent C and treat C. diff infections. Um, St. John's wort definitely helps with depression. Ginger can help with nausea, much in the same way that Zofran does. Astragalus and mushrooms can help with immunity. Now, this isn't to say that these supplements don't have other side effects or interactions that we need to be mindful of, but they actually can provide a therapeutic benefit. Um, 
And um, when I was speaking with Jamie, um, she mentioned that a lot of patients and doctors are asking about and recommending anti-inflammatory supplements. So things such as fish oil, turmeric, ginger, ginseng, cranberry, flax seeds, garlic can be quite anti-inflammatory, um, particularly with people with things like rheumatoid arthritis, which might have a quite, um, quite a lot of inflammation going on in their bodies. We actually find that the um, omega-3s, EPA and DHA actually can decrease these th uh, four markers of inflammation in our blood. Whereas our omega-6s, the ceramic acid, mostly increases these markers of inflammation in our blood. So there definitely is an effect that we see. Um, now, how about this from food for supplements? Well, eating these foods or taking these foods or herbs through um, diet is always a great way to go um, because then you're also displacing foods that may be inflammatory. Um, turmeric, for example, is not very um, bioavailable um, from food or supplements. So sometimes it's recommended to take a supplement, sometimes it's not. But even with something like turmeric, as I mentioned before, there are some interactions. For example, turmeric is not recommended for people with a history of gallstones, um, it may not be good for people on blood thinners um, or on other medications like chemotherapies. Um, so we just want to be mindful of that, whereas eating the food form may not be a problem at all because of the potency of the supplement versus the food. Um, I also wanted to list some reliable websites and resources that you could use in order to evaluate supplements for yourself or your patients. I put a star next to the two that are free and for use of the public. So About Herbs and Botanicals from Memorial Sloan Kettering is a great site you can use. And it, even though it's put out by Memorial Sloan Kettering, doesn't only focus on oncology. Um, it has great uh, resources for showing food drug interactions, efficacy, um, so it's a wonderful resource. Um, natural medicines is another great resource, but it is sub sub subscription based. It's a little more comprehensive, I think, than the more moral Sloan Kettering site, um, but it is subscription based. Some health systems do subscribe, some don't. Um, and Consumer Labs is another really cool website. It's actually a third party that goes out and tests that what's in the label is actually um, in the supplement or food, and they put out reports about it. And a lot of times it's kind of like they're muckrakers. If they find that what was in a food or a supplement is actually not what was on the label, companies then will go and try to improve their product. So I took a quick screenshot of one of their investigation um, grids. Um, so they were looking at different sources of cacao and dark chocolate, and they found that a lot of them um, actually contained heavy metals like cadmium and lead. Um, this was back in 2017 and 2019, so they haven't done another investigation since, but um, when this report came out, a lot of these chocolate companies were up in arms and actually took note of um, what they found and hopefully took some of their recommendations with them. So I'll leave you with this before we get into some questions. Um, when you have a patient who's interested in taking a supplement or is currently taking a supplement, I always kind of like to ask them why, uh, not as a judgmental why, but just as a really educational why. You know, most of us have heard of the placebo effect that taking a supplement can actually, um, if we think that it can help us, actually can help us. There's also something called the nocebo effect, and that's just the opposite. If you tell someone that this isn't going to help them, it may not help them, um, even if it actually could help them. So there's some really powerful psychological things that go on with supplements, which sometimes give a people give people a sense of control over whatever is going on in their lives. Um, at the same time, um, it is our job ethically to do no harm. So by just finding out why they're taking a supplement, if we determine that it's not appropriate for them, we may be able to find a substitute in order to meet their goal. Um, you know, again, if they have an iron deficiency, perhaps we can get up to that iron level, um, iron dosage through food if they're having severe GI side effects. Um, if they're taking something that interacts, perhaps there's something we can find um, through food or another supplement that doesn't interact. So 
just an important piece. And thank you. Thank you guys for listening. And um, I'd be happy to turn it over to Jamie for any questions, um, anything um, that I can share. Thank you so much, Hillary. That was such a great presentation. And I think it addressed a lot of the questions we see in, in the pharmacy world. So I have sure. one to read over. Um, so I have one that says, how does pregnancy affect metabolism? How does pregnancy affect metabolism? So that's um, a really good question. So it's interesting. Um, so in the first trimester of pregnancy, mm -hmm. a lot of our micronutrient needs are increased a lot. So that's why typically prenatal vitamins are recommended for women just of childbearing age, regardless of whether they are thinking about conceiving or not. Uh, most women don't realize or find out they're pregnant till at least a month or two in and certain nutrients like folate or folic acid um, is really important in those first few weeks of pregnancy to ensure that um, the child doesn't develop any neural tube defects. So um, iron is another one that we know is um, really upregulated in those first few weeks of pregnancy. Our blood volume actually expands by 50% in the beginning of pregnancy. So we want to ensure that a person's getting enough iron in their diets. Um, for that group, supplement, routine supplementation of multivitamins, prenatal vitamins is recommended. Um, and then throughout pregnancy, our macronutrient needs also change. Um, everybody is a little bit different in terms of how they feel during pregnancy. Some people don't feel so good the first trimester. That's not true for everybody, but typically our macronutrient needs don't actually increase in the beginning, meaning we don't necessarily even need more additional calories, although we do need those extra micronutrients. Um, in the third trimester, that's when our um, calorie needs actually increase and we need about 500 extra calories a day. Um, in order to meet the um, anabolic effects, the demands of both the fetus and the demands of the women's body. Um, during um, pregnancy also, a lot of people don't realize the mother's body actually produces um, breast milk before the baby's even born, regardless of whether someone chooses or is able to breastfeed. So the body has to produce that. So there's a lot of um, nutritional needs that increase. So I hope I answered the question. Thank you so much. I'm gonna invite Tamara to ask the last question. Sure. Uh, thank you, Hillary, for such a great presentation. It was so informative. I just have a quick question, like a follow-up to the previous question, kind of. What is your opinion on prescription uh, prenatal vitamins versus over-the-counter? A lot of time patients ask in the pharmacy which one is recommended. That's a really, really good question. And I'll just tell you, I'll lay out what the pros and cons are in my mind. So if you're getting a prescription prenatal vitamin, you are ensuring that what is in the label is actually what's in the bottle, which we can't actually ensure unless a supplement has the USP label on it. Um, we can't actually ensure that if we're just getting some random off, out, off the counter um, supplement. Um, so in especially in terms of contaminants during pregnancy, that's a really important thing. By contrast, prescription prenatal vitamins uh, may not have the mix of nutrients that a person is looking for. So there's some nuances that may could be tailored towards certain individuals. For example, um, I mentioned before iron could be um, could cause GI side effects like constipation. Um, that is true of certain forms of supplemental iron and not other forms of supplemental iron. So you may find that in the prescription ones, you're going to get the more binding kind as compared with some of the nuanced over-the-counter ones. Um, another example of that is the nutrient choline, which I mentioned only has an adequate intake level now, but there's some really interesting research that women who take choline throughout their pregnancy tend to have smarter children. We don't know, there hasn't been a ton of research on it, but some prenatal vitamins will throw that choline in, whereas the prescription ones probably don't since it only has an adequate intake level. And then the other main example that I could think of off the top of, well, there's a few other ones, um, certain B vitamins like B12 and folate, 
for some people with the MTHFR gene, which I could even do a whole lecture on, they may have trouble actually converting the supplemental form into the active form in their bodies. So certain kinds of prenatal supplements have the methylated form in them. So it's easily absorbed. And then lastly, some of the bottled kinds also have DHA in them, which may be also important for prenatal brain development, whereas prescription ones might not. So it's kind of these trade-offs. Um, if prescription ones are also covered financially, that might be better. And it's always important that a person's taking it as compared with not. If money is of no value, I would say finding a good over-the-counter one that has the USP label on it might be the best way to go. Thank you so much for answering this. Thank you, Hillary. Um, I guess tying into pregnancy, are there like certain foods that should be avoided during pregnancy? I guess seafood and like raw fish would be one of them. Definitely. So there's foods for different reasons that um, is recommended to avoid during pregnancy. Um, so first off, there's foods for food safety reasons that's recommended to avoid during pregnancy because certain bacteria could cross the placenta. So for example, um, unpasteurized cheese is not recommended to eat. So some of the soft crumbly cheeses like feta cheese or blue cheese, um, they do make pasteurized versions, but may or may not be pasteurized. Um, raw or undercooked meat or fish um, is not recommended. Eggs has to be cooked. Deli meat sliced at a deli counter may be contaminated with listeria. So if somebody eats that, they recommend heating it up to kill the bacteria. Um, sprouts, not like Brussels sprouts, but more like sandwich sprouts, like alfalfa sprouts. If people eat them, it's usually recommended to cook them rather than eat them raw um, because they just tend to get more bacteria growth. And then there's certain foods for mercury reasons that it's um, in the it's recommended to minimize consumption of. So certain foods like um, tuna fish, somebody eats it, it's recommended that they eat it very sparingly as opposed to more regularly um, during pregnancy. Um, and those are the foods that really come to the top of my mind that would be recommended to avoid um, during that time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask about vegan butter. What are your thoughts about vegan butter? Yeah, um, I, I really would have to look up what they're made from, to be honest, and how they make them. Of course, if they're hydrogenating them in the process they use to make margarine, where they take a liquid fat and they create a solid fat, that would not be good. So if the label said um, trans fat or partially hydrogenated, that would not be recommended. But vegan butters might also be made from certain nut milks uh, and certain stabilizers that make it a little more solid. So in that sense, it might be fine. Um, but I, act, I have to look up what's actually in them. That's a really good question. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, because I'm thinking most of them are margarine, but you're right. It could be nut butters. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, they could be some of them. Thank you. And then how about like protein substitutes? Like I know that some people who are trying to build muscle, they may drink protein drinks or protein bars. Do you have any mm -hmm. advice about those substitutes? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and again, it depends why somebody is taking it or eating it, drinking it, or taking it, and what um, their diet is looking like. So a lot of times, as I mentioned, people, especially in America, are way overdoing their protein needs. We depending on who you are, what life stage you're at, what's going on in your body, we need about 0.8 to 1.0 grams for, of protein for every kilogram of body weight. So um, for example, if you're a 150 pound person, that's really only about 68 grams of protein per day. Um, and just as a reference, a three ounce serving of animal protein. So whether that's chicken or fish or red meat, three ounces is only the size of a deck of cards. Um, it has about 21 grams of protein in it. 
And most times people are eating more than the size of deck of cards of protein. Um, so let's just say you're eating double the deck of cards. That's already 42 grams of protein at that single meal. And we may, you know, again, 150 pound person, depending on what's going on, um, needs only about 68 grams of protein per day. So it really depends on, again, what's going on in their life and what they're eating. I always try to stay food first. Um, we really want to choose some of the, if they're having protein shake or supplement, I always want to choose kind of a clean one that's either been investigated by the consumer labs. Um, some of them are contaminated with metals and things like that as well, that we just have to be mindful of. Um, but they could be a really great resource for other people who, for whatever reason, are having trouble eating enough. Um, patients and clients that I've worked with, um, some of them really um, benefit from them. So it comes down to really the individual, I think. But if it's possible to get enough protein from food, I always say that's a little better. Thank you. That's great advice. How about, are there foods that increase HDL? Yeah, that's a good question. We certainly know that exercise increases HDL or our good cholesterol. Um, there's some evidence, although it's kind of weak evidence that resveratrol, our, our favorite phytonutrient that's found in red grapes or red wine, also might increase our HDL. But there's not that much um, other um, foods that increase it to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Um, how about your opinion about like organic foods, like organic produce versus organic other foods? Yeah, it's a good question. I always say that regardless of whether organic or not, it's always great to be getting enough fruits and vegetables, more importantly. So um, I always think that should be the main focus. Um, but there is a list called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. The dirty dozen are the top 12 fruits and vegetables that are sprayed more heavily with pesticides as compared with the clean 15, which really aren't. Um, so you could Google that li those lists, but when you look at them, some of them are intuitive. Like for example, bananas, we peel them, may not be as important to buy organic, whereas certain fruits like grapes or berries, which are sprayed pretty heavily, if you have the option and ability to buy organic, it may be a better choice. Um, there's not a ton of research or there's not a ton of good research on organic first knot. Some say that it might have some more nutrients in it. Some say that the chemicals may not be great in the body over time, especially human bodies can't always rid of these chemicals. Um, but we don't necessarily know the answer. We just do, we do know that eating adequate phytochemicals, antioxidants, micronutrients um, is more important than anything. Awesome, thank you. Um, I had another question about antioxidants. You mentioned like vitamin C, zinc, and a bunch of others. What are your opinions about like cold remedies such as coldies or emergency or sick or packets that we can dissolve or drink and then like natural honey and lemon and garlic? Yeah, I think for a lot of immune boosting remedies, there's some that are really good to use as needed. Unfortunately, we're living in a time where there's illness all around um, constantly. So it's really important that a person isn't necessarily taking these things on a daily basis just to protect themselves. Um, for example, um, zinc actually can compete with copper absorption. And one sign of inadequate copper levels in our body is anemia. And most people, when they see that they're anemic, they don't think of copper, they think of other sorts of nutrients like iron. Um, so it may be something that's not addressed right away. Um, but if these things are taken on more and as needed basis, they definitely could help. There is some evidence, weak evidence that vitamin C helps. There's definitely evidence that zinc can help. There's evidence that astragalus and certain mushroom extracts can help um, protect against um, illness. And then a lot of people have their own remedies um, like apple cider vinegar, um, like um, lemon, ginger, honey. Um, and a lot of these things can just um, build nutrient stores in the body to just help our body um, better be able to fight off infection. 
Thank you. And I have one last question. So what are some reasons why your clients and patients consult you in your um, separate company, like your LLC, compared to when they meet you in Monitor? That's a great question. So um, at my role at Northwell's Montreal Cancer Center, I am seeing oncology patients, both people who are actively receiving treatment and survivors. Um, in my private practice, I see people of with all kinds of needs. I see a fair share of oncology patients, but I also have clients who have like, for example, gestational diabetes, I was working with a family who was trying to figure out eating dynamics within the family and the best way to promote healthy eating within the whole family. So um, I, I think I just have a more broad spectrum in my private practice as compared to um, over at Northwell. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your talk. I think this was such a great night and I hope everyone got to take away as much as I got to take away from this cool topic and everyone i'd like to give hillary a great round of applause i can't you can't really see everyone here but <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much and thank you for inviting me and um i really appreciate being a part of this yeah thank you and hope to bring you back absolutely yeah it seems like pregnancy is a hot topic so maybe we could do a presentation on that <laughs> <laughs> So I'd like to present the CE codes for the pharmacists and pharmacy technicians claiming credit. The pharmacist CE code is DIET, D-I-E-T, DIET, and the pharmacy technician CE code is RESOURCE, R-E-S-O-U-R-C-E, -E, RESOURCE. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you guys. Have a great night and stay safe. Thank you, Hillary. No problem. Take care. Take care.